A warm welcome to this talk. It's Wednesday the 27th of December and I hope you had a celebratory restful Christmas. Now I'm going to start off with some good news today then I've got two pieces of pretty poor news I'm afraid actually. Uh, one is about um, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority apparently sending some might say inappropriate communications with the press and the other is the really high uh, death rate in adults, younger adults and uh, middle-aged adults in the United Kingdom that is persisting. And there's a real issue here that's simply not being adequately discussed. But let's start off with the good news. Uh, this is uh, Mr uh, Andrew Bridgen's site. So he's been given a motion to discuss in Parliament. Um, so this is on the 16th of January relating to excess uh, deaths. So please write to your MP and ask them to attend the Westminster Hall debate. Now, we really could do with some MPs turning up this time. And we don't want any M MPs being um, discouraged for, from attending. So I've put the link. If you're in the UK, you can write to your MP, say, Oi, we are paying you guys. Pitch up, listen to the debate, take part in the debate. Excess deaths are going on and we need to find out why. So that is the good news. Um, that is the link there for checking out with your uh, MP. I'll, I'll paste that. Now, a threatening phone call. This is from the Daily Telegraph, and this really is quite concerning. I was actually a bit taken aback. 8th of November 2023. So in March 2021, 20, the Telegraph was one of the first newspapers to imply a causal link between the jab, in this case the AstraZeneca, and blood clots after Norwegian scientists suggested a plausible mechanism. Good, that is what the media should be doing investigative journalism on the day we published the story we received a threatening phone call now, th this is not me this is directly from the newspaper we received a threatening phone call from a senior official at the mhra warning that the telegraph would be banned from future briefings and press notices if we did not soften the news now that is direct from the newspaper now, you might have thought that the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency was there to, oh, I don't know, you know re regulate healthcare products and medicines. But apparently they're also uh, due to keep the press in line now as well, at least on this occasion. So this is their website here, official government body, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, does it need to change its name uh, and, and press monitoring service? Uh, make sure that only the official narrative is, is dispensed? Um, this is why I think this is really quite a bad news story that they've got involved in this. I was a bit taken aback when I read that, to be quite honest. Phone call. Right, part of the UK government. Now, there is an article in the uh, British Medical Journal from the FDA to the MHRA, so Food and Drug Administration in the States, to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK. Are drug regulators for hire? Um, are drug regulators for hire? Um, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm not going to try and tell you what to think, but I will give you some information. Now, this is from Features BMJ Investigation. This was published in June 2022. Now, that article in the British Medical Journal says this, industry money saturates the globe's leading regulators. So this is industry, like pharmaceutical industry money, saturates the globe's leading regulators. The BMJ found that the majority of regulators' budget, you know, particularly the portion focused on drugs, is derived from industry fees. Now, this is the figure from the UK. Other agencies are given, but in the UK, for the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, 86%. 86%. So I guess that means 14% is not industry funded. So 86% is industry funded. That's an eight with a six after it and a percentage. 86% is industry funded. Budget, total budget being 159 million. Um, and this is the agency that wrote to the Telegraph to tell it to, in the words of the Telegraph, what was it? Soften, soften the news, soften the news. Now, the Telegraph article goes on. Now, another well-known Cambridge academic got in touch to complain about our disgraceful fear-mongering headline on the story, claiming that it would discourage vaccine uptake and cost lives. 
We politely pointed out, this is the Telegraph speaking, we politely pointed out that uh, hiding the facts from people was not helpful and could also cost lives. Hiding the facts from people. Hiding facts from people is not helpful and could cost lives. What is there to disagree with here? You know, the public is not as stupid as some people think it is. In February this year, um, TikTok removed an audio clip. This is still from the Daily Telegraph. TikTok removed an audio clip in which I discuss, this is the writer of the Telegraph article, uh, whether the benefits of vaccination was worth the risks for young people, claiming it had breached community guidelines. So TikTok didn't seem to be very happy. After we showed that the government's own website acknowledged the link, the clip was uh, reinstated. It's good that there was actually some dialogue here because very often with um, uh, media outlets, um, effective dialogue is really not possible. Um, anyway, so that was good that that happened. Um, all of this shows a troubling paternalism, still from the Daily Telegraph, in government, academia and some media outlets some media outlets you can say what you think those media outlets might be um, some media outlets who believe that the public is not capable of weighing up the pros and cons of medical interventions and so must be shielded from the truth again direct quotes from the uh, from the daily telegraph there so really quite concerning that uh, a, a products regulatory agency is also seeking to control the narrative um, I was I was really quite taken aback when I read that. Anyway, that's the facts. Make what you want of it. That is the article there that I quoted from about the saturation with industry money uh, from FDA, MHRA, our drug regulators for hire from the British Medical Journal. Now, I want to go on and give you some other really quite disconcerting news. Now, now this is from this journal article here excess mortality in england post covid19 pandemic implications for a second for secondary prevention and as you'll see this is published in the lancet regional health europe now of course the lancet is a name that commands respect or it did But when a lot, a lot of people see it's in The Lancet, that's kind of a bit of a slam dunk, really. Um, and a, a few years ago, that's what I believed. Is it still the case? Not for me to tell you what to think. I'll just give you some information. So here's the article here. Excess mortality in England post-COVID-19 pandemic. Lancet Regional Health Europe. That is the link. Check it out for yourself. This is all there. Now, I did check on The Lancet uh, site for this paper, uh, for the uh, Lancet Regional Health Europe. And I was a little bit concerned because I did find this um, £4,000 fee is the article publishing charge for open access. So if you want to publish in this journal and you want it to be open access, which is good, it means everyone can access it, then that's fine, just stomp up £4,000. So... People that want their work to be read widely, open access, so anyone can get it, £4,000 and the journal will facilitate that. Now, this is not uncommon, sadly, uh, at the moment, that there is this fee for open, open, uh, open access publishing. Pity, but my question is, if you pay £4,000, you're probably going to get more people reading your article. That's uh, quite a lot of money, really, unless you're funded externally or by an institution. Anyway, I'll leave that with you. That's just, that's just by the by. Now, this is from the article. Um, Many countries, including the UK, have continued to experience an apparent excess, uh, excess of deaths um, long after the peaks associated with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Right. So, yes, we are experiencing excess deaths around the world as we have tried to raise the alarm several times, many times. Numbers of excess deaths estimated in this period are considerable. We agree completely. Um, UK Office for National Statistics, ONS, has calculated that there were 7.2% or 44,255 more deaths registered in the UK in 2022. 
So that's ONS data, fair enough. Now, there are legitimate differences in the way that data is collected, of course. We did look uh, last week at the OECD data for the UK, which shows that for the same period, it's actually 52,000, so about another 8,000 higher, 9.26% higher. Um, not saying there's anything strange there. That's ONS numbers. We have been alerted by people like Professor Norman Fenton into deficits or problems with the ONS data, but it is in the same range. It's a concerning number, whatever. Now, this article goes on. Um, the this, this persisted into 2023 with 8.6% or 28,000. More deaths registered in the first six months of the year, so 28,000 and 24 people more dying than we would expect first six months of the year as per this article uh, based on based primarily on ONS uh, data but so so that, that's fine the, the, these small differences aren't really surprising in the way that data is collected and we have this difficulty of course comparing country with country it, it, there are there are differences anyway OEC data for that period, well, the OEC data for the first 44 weeks of 2023 was actually 49,000 deaths, uh, 389 deaths, 9.44%. So in the first 44 weeks of, um, according to the OECD, first 44 weeks of 2023, 9.44% excess deaths compared to 9.26% excess deaths in 2022. So we see that in 2022 and 2023, we've got in the order of 9% excess deaths for the data that we have. Now, let's hope this plummets for the last part of 2023, but I'm afraid I'm not hopeful that's going to be the case. Anyway, carrying on reading from this article from the uh, Lancet. The causes of multiple excess deaths are likely to be multiple and could include direct effects of COVID-19 infection. Yes, um, but we know that that's not very many at all now. Um, the majority of these deaths are not COVID related. We now know that, certainly in the current time period. Now, acute pressure on the NHS services resulted in poor outcomes from episodes of acute illness. Acute pressures on the NHS being blamed here. Wait for it. And disruption to chronic disease detection and management. So chronic disease detection and management being blamed. Further analysis by, by cause and age and sex group may help quantify the relative contributions of these causes. And um, no other causes that I could see were given. There's the paragraph there. Now, the question in my mind is, could there be any other causes operating here? Other than, other than acute pressures on the NHS and chronic uh, disease detection and management. Is that it? Is there any other possibilities? Has anything else changed prior to the data when the OEC data was collected, for example, 15, 2015 to 2019? Has anything else changed? Anything else that we could think of that's changed? Well, yeah, acute pressures on the NHS detection and management of, of disease, but, but this is repeated in multiple countries around the world. This is an international phenomena, as we looked at in, in the last video. And I was a bit surprised that they didn't come up with any other possibilities. Anyway, we'll go on. Office for Health Improvements and Disparities. Now, this is data from the 3rd of June 2022 to the 30th of June 2023. So that's what, about a 13-month period. So thir 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 13 months of data here. Now, um, when we have looked at this before, this is largely from the Office for Health Improvements and Disparities, but it, it is as reported, it is as reported in this uh, in this journal article. Read it for yourself. Um, now, uh, excess deaths for all causes were relatively greatest for 50 to 64 year olds, 15% uh, higher than expected. So 50 to 64 years. Now, this is not really the age group. The, the average age of death from COVID, of course, is, is way higher than that. This is not a COVID-related age group, really, that's dying. And yet they are dying. 15% higher than expected. 11% for 25 to 49-year-olds. Now, these are relatively young adults, 11% higher. 
And also, um, as far as I could gather from the way the article was written, 11% higher for younger than 25. So what we see is young adults aged what? Um, well, younger than 25, 18 to 25, 25 to 49, dying 11% more than we would expect. Slightly older adults, 50 to 64, dying 15% uh, higher than we would expect. And of course, these young adults are not dying primarily of COVID. Not at all. About 9% higher for over 65s. Right. <clears throat> now, several causes in the 13-month th period. Cardiovascular disease up by 12%. Heart failure up by 20%. Ischemic heart disease, not enough blood supply to the myocardium, up by 15%. Liver disease up by 19%. Acute respiratory infections up by 14%. Diabetes up by 13%. Now, I believe that the, what is it, the, the Office for uh, Health Improvements and Disparities... I don't know in detail how they collect their data, but I've no reason to, to doubt that this is, is anything but completely accurate. So if we take, for example, ischemic heart disease, primarily caused by disease of the coronary arteries, they're like a crown, a coronary, around about the heart, supplying the myocardium, the pumping muscle of the heart with blood. And they must have a patent lumen. If they get clogged up, if they become inflamed, they can get clogged up with atheroma, atherosclerosis the disease process of atherosclerosis that can lead to reduced blood supply ischemia that can lead to thrombus formation uh, an acute coronary syndrome myocardial infarction fair enough 15 percent more of that but we have to what we have to look at is the proximal and the distal cause of disease this is what's not being done so any disease there's a proximal cause or any death there's a proximal cause so yes, this person died of ischemic heart disease. That is the immediate cause of death. But what led to the ischemic heart disease? What are the distal causes? Is the question that really needs to be focused on. Again, heart failure up by 20%. Yes, heart failure is when the myocardium is not contracting sufficiently to generate sufficient cardiac output to meet the metabolic demands of the body, often accompanied by venous congestion and edema. We know what heart failure is. So that's the immediate cause of death. But what caused the heart failure? What caused the heart failure? Have we got a national curiosity deficit disorder? We should be asking these questions. I'm afraid it gets worse for the slightly older age group. For middle-aged adults, 50 to 64, cardiovascular disease, 33% higher than expected. Ischemic heart disease, 44% higher than expected. But what the heck is causing the ischemic heart disease? What is the distal causes? Cerebrovascular disease up by 40%, heart failure up by 39%, acute respiratory infection, 43% higher, diabetes, 33%, 35% higher. So this, these older adults are dying at really, well, all, all adults are dying at a much higher rate. Adults aged 50 to 64 are dying at particularly a higher rate. My question is, we need to look at the proximal causes. Yes, this is the cause of death. The distal causes, what led up? In the case of the coronary arteries we, that we looked at, for example, what led to the infl inflammation? What led to the potentially accelerated rate of the development of atherosclerosis? Where's the pathology on this? Now, OK, this article can't list the whole thing, but... Um, that's the question I would like to, to have addressed. Uh, the pattern is now one of persistent excess deaths, which are most prominent in relative terms in middle-aged and younger adults. Um, this is an unfolding tragedy, in my view. Young, fit adults are dying at accelerated rates. Proximal causes identified. Distal causes not identified. And I'm not, I'm not going at this particular article. I mean, I'm talking generally. Uh, you really don't read much about what is causing the immediate cause of, of death. The pattern is now one of uh, persisting excess deaths, which are most prominent. Yeah, younger age adults. Right, timely and granular analysis are needed to describe such trends so as to inform uh, prevention and disease management efforts. So timely, okay, yeah, we, we need to do a longitudinal sort of study on this. It needs to be done now. Granular, I guess, I guess what they mean there is looking at the nitty-gritty of it, looking at things like uh, 
age, sex, smoking status, what medication someone's had over the past few years, a- any variable you can think of, I don't know whether they've had particular injections or not. All these things should be analysed. So they're right, granular analysis. And uh, the, the article does conclude, I'll just show you it here. The article concludes with uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, declaration of interest. Uh, now remember the causes were put down as uh, acute and chronic disease, um, largely due to NHS problems. But this is this is uh, I'm not going to bother with names. Uh, but th- th- this is direct from the article. This is the uh, lead author, uh, I think lead author and corresponding author. Okay, does various things. Um, uh, oh, and reports personal fees from Novo Nordisk, big Danish, I think, pharmaceutical company, and uh, Pfizer. Doesn't say how much money comes from there to the author, but uh, that interest uh, is declared. I've given you the information as accurately as I can. Make of it what you will. How, how long are these excess deaths going to go on for? 2022, 2023, 9% or more in the UK and around the world. If you're watching this video, you're as frustrated as I am. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.